are in our final uh, installment of this series that we are camping out on over the last few weeks, the story of the prodigal son. And I want to encourage anybody who didn't get a copy of the prodigal son uh, or the story of the prodigal God by Tim Keller to, to do that. I, we may be out by now, so anybody who took five copies, seek somebody who, who needs a copy. No, just kidding, but not really. But as we, uh, again, it's, I think it's a book that's worth getting into, and this is really worth camping out on. The reason why Luke chapter 15 is so important to camp out on is because what's revealed there is what God cares about most. I mean, so many people are like, what does God really want from me? What does God really care about? I hear a lot of different things. Jesus makes it incredibly clear in this chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And here's why else this matters is because it has everything to do with how we're supposed to faithfully live as followers of Jesus. Last week I talked about my coffee spill incidents, which by the way was great because I got lots of stories back of people embarrassing coffee spills. And even there were three stories of people that spilled coffee on Sunday, last Sunday. So it was great. I got all, and I'm sorry you spilled your coffee. But my whole point of that illustration is that what spills out is whatever's in the cup. In other words, you, you run into me, and my coffee spill, you know, tea doesn't pour out. It's coffee. Whatever in your cup is what spills out. And the takeaway is this. This is like life. When life runs into us, when things get hard, when we struggle, what is it that spills out? One of the biggest issues that's happening today, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, it's been kind of a rough couple of years. But the the thing that's been really tough is that Christians who should have the love and grace of Jesus spilling out of them are spilling out what everybody else is spilling out, anger and anxiety and frustration. We did a whole series on it this fall called Love in the Age of Outrage. What needs to spill out of us should be something that is like God's heart spilling out of us, not all the dysfunction and twisted up stuff that ends up coming out. Not that you shouldn't have your own convictions, your own political persuasions, your your stance on social issues. That's all fine and that's important and that's for you. But is that stuff twisting you up inside? Is it causing you to not act with the love, mercy, and grace of Jesus? That's why we're camping out on this for a little while, to be reminded of that truth. Philippians 2 says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So if you want something to put on your fridge to point to when your kids act up, everything without complaining or arguing. And why? So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. And what we said last week was what? We need the love and mercy of the Father to spill out of us. We need to get our shine back as people of faith. Because what the pandemic has done is it's really just been like jet fuel to all the problems that existed for the church before. Don't know if you've noticed this, but churches and Christianity and pastors, do you know pastors? They are only 1% in the minds of of the public, they're only 1% higher degree of trust than lawyers. <laughs> lawyers, I love you. It's not a, I'm just saying. There's not a whole lot of trust. And here's the problem. It's for good reason. We've all heard the stories of churches misusing funds. And we heard stories of pastors buying $6,000 sneakers and doing their sermons. And like, <laughs> I just want to make it a point. These are Kohl's. I think they were $40, so, all right? Or like, we need to raise money for the pastor's G6. You're like, <laughs> what even is that? I don't know what that is, but, but that ain't it. Why, why does this matter? It's so that we will shine in a darkened world. So people will look at us and be like, wow, they love different. They trust different. They show grace different. What's up with them? They see the love of Jesus shining through us. 
I think, too, we get it a little bit backwards when it comes to God because we think, well, God wants something from me. Like, God wants a price. And this is the kind of stuff that Jesus is really trying to combat. It's not that he wants something from us. He wants something for us. And the reason that I try to do what God wants in my life has nothing to do with me trying to win his approval. It's just out of gratitude. Imagine you're a child and you are rescued by a stranger out of a burning house. Saved your life. You wouldn't have made it otherwise. Wouldn't you, for the rest of your life, try to honor the person that saved you? I don't know. I would be, I'd be like, so what do you want for Christmas? (laughs) Happy birthday. Like, I would just, I would honestly, and then I would try to kind of prove that I was worth saving. I would give them updates. Hey, you know, family had a great year. Things are going good. You know, trying to make the most of this life that he, he risked his own to save. It'd be even worse than that if he actually perished trying to save me. He saves me and then passes away. Now imagine that person isn't a stranger. That person's your own father. How would that hit you? Now imagine it's your heavenly father, the creator of heaven and earth, who laid down his life so that you would live. I follow God because I'm so thankful for what he did for me. God's not just sort of like waiting to be like, all right, you got some behaviors here. You got to sit in the penalty box for a little while. You got to pay the piper on these things. No, no, no. Don't get me wrong. God cares about how we live and the choices we make, but not for the reason you might think. Not because he's looking to point a finger He's looking to bring you back, to bring you home. He wants you fulfilled and flourishing. So what we learn in chapter 15 is this. What God cares about most is to seek out and rescue his lost children. And he does it at great expense to himself. One of the things I've heard over the years is, well, grace is cheap. All I have to do is believe. Then you don't really understand the gospel It came at great expense, God's expense, not ours. It's costly, God's grace, and yet it's freely available. Luke chapter 15, Jesus tries to explain the difference between God's heart and the human heart. So remember, he's got the tax collectors and sinners. This is why Jesus, a parable is a made-up story that Jesus made to teach a point. So he's got the tax collectors and sinners on one side, the people who were the immoral ones, and then he had the moral ones, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And this story is for both of them. Younger son, elder son. And what we learn in the first part of Luke 15 when he tells the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin is that what God cares about, he's more concerned with rescuing sinners than dwelling on the fact that they sin. He doesn't dwell on all the things they're doing wrong. He dwells on how do we go rescue them. Like with the sheep, wouldn't the shepherd leave the 99 behind to go chase the one? The lost coin, the woman loses a coin of great value and she turns her whole house over, she finds it. And Jesus says there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. That's the point. That's showing God's heart. And then, of course, we end with what we've been looking at the last few weeks the parable of the prodigal son. And the resource we've been using, uh, The Prodigal God by Tim Keller, hopefully has been a blessing to you. And I'm going to encourage you, if you don't have it, if you didn't pick it up when you were here, to go home and to order it. You could get it under 10 bucks, and um, it's, it's worth every penny and then some. But what we learn is that both sons are equally lost. That's the big shocker. Both sons are equally lost. Because being lost is about a lack of relationship with Jesus. You can do all the wrong things and have a lack of relationship with Jesus, but that's what, we all know that. We can identify with the younger son and all the way he went and he squandered his inheritance and in wild living. (laughs) We know what that is. Everything you're not supposed to do. Like, we get it. He was immoral. 
and you hit a low point. What we don't really get is that you could be just as lost and be morally upright. You could, be a, you could do bad things and be lost. You could do good things and be lost because the point is not the things themselves, it's the relationship with the Father. Here's what I mean. Seventh grade me, so uh, many of you know I grew up in the Los Angeles area. I went to a house party in the hills, in the hills, and the guest of honor was none other than, I don't even know if you're going to remember this guy, Will Wheaton. Remember him from Stand By Me? Listen, he was a big deal. He was a big deal when I was in seventh grade. Stand By Me had come out like a year before. He was incredibly popular. I think he did Star Trek stuff later. I don't know, any Will Wheaton fan, fan club here? Anyway, this is your day. Uh, so I, I go to the party. And I see Will Wheaton there, and boy, you know, he was about my age. Boy, did he love being the center of the party. I'm sure he's a great guy. And I would have done the same thing if I were him. So I'm at this party, and he's, I'll never forget, it was a big giant house that had like a big open middle. So there was an upstairs and downstairs, but like a big, like Madison Square Garden or something, like a big area. And he's in an armchair in the middle with sunglasses on. That dude was cool. All right? So I'm all like fanboying over Will Wheaton. I'm like really excited that he's there, but I'm way too shy to ever approach him. He's got tons of people around, right? So I end up, I, I never talk to him. I end up leaving the party. But guess what I told all my friends on Monday morning? Yeah. I was at the party with Will Wheaton. Yeah, yeah, I met him. Yeah, we're boys. Yeah, it was great. He was so cool. I feel like maybe you could relate. I know I've been guilty in my life of this. That I treat God a little bit like that. Hey, I'm a big fan. Big fan. I'm so like excited to know I know everything about you. I know all the information, right? I know about your career, God. Pretty amazing. But I don't actually engage. There's no relationship there. I might go out to all my friends and tell them there's a relationship there. Well, there's not. And that's the reason we end up lost. It's not because we lived one way or another. It's because we didn't have a relationship. This is what Jesus is trying to drive home. He's, he's trying to drive home to sinners that you're accepted, right? God loves you no matter what. You got to repent and believe. And then he's telling all the, all the religious people, hey, you're missing something big. I love you, but for you, it's all about the law and the legal requirements of what I'm supposed to do. You're missing it. It's about relationship. And what Jesus was doing, of course, was he was reframing, completely reframing their understanding of sin and forgiveness. As I had mentioned, like a pitcher of water and the ink that goes in. You can't separate out the ink once it's in there. It diffuses across the whole pitcher. That's like sin in human beings. It's not like you'd escape, stop doing a couple of things, and then you've removed all the sin from your life. No, the only way that you get new water, or, or to get the water clean, is to get new water. You gotta empty it out, and we believe that new water is often referred to as the living water in Jesus Christ. All right. We've read this parable a couple of times, so I'm not gonna read the whole thing. If you want to, I wanna encourage you, go read it on your own this week. It's worth the read. We're just gonna focus on the, on the last part of it, kind of the tail end of it, beginning in verse 22. The feast of the Father. But the Father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. This is when the younger son came home. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Now, when a father, this is back in Jesus' day, when the father was hosting a feast, it's a little different now. Like, usually, you, you, like a Will Wheaton party, the honored guest is, is the guest, Will Wheaton. Back in Jesus' day, the person of honor was the person throwing the feast, the father. He was the one that was to be honored. This is his feast.
feast after all. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Notice, I think this is another clue that both sons are lost. Notice the father does the same thing with both sons. He goes out to them. To mean what? They're not in. He goes out to them. Which would have been so shocking in every way for the people listening. The father come running to accept the son that squandered his inheritance. First of all, ask for it while you're still alive. Dad, let's pretend you're dead. You give me all my money. And then he does it. He squanders it. Comes back home and the father actually loves him still. Or like accepts him. He goes out to them to bring them back. And here's the thing about the elder son. This is really important not to miss. He refused to go into the biggest feast his father ever hosted. This would have been a remarkable, deliberate act of disrespect. Remember, the honored guest is the father. No. Now listen, the Pharisees who were listening to this weren't dumb. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. It was a complete reversal of everything they believed. I thought it was all about doing the things just right. I want to show a little love for the Pharisees, though, because, man, we're hard on them. There's a reason Jesus keeps engaging them. He loved them. He really wanted them to get this. Otherwise, he wouldn't say it over and over and over again. I think we all have a little bit of a Pharisee heart, perhaps, from time to time. These are the way things should be. This is how you should respond to God in your life. This is how you should care about. That's that's not God's heart. Keller says this, there are two ways to be your own Lord and Savior. You can break all the laws and be bad or keep all the laws and be good. It's like the difference between moral religion and actual faith, right? Morality-based religion says what? I obey, therefore God loves me. The gospel says God loves me, therefore I obey. He rescued me from the fire. I'm obeying because I'm so thankful. I love him so much. I want to do what he wants me to do with my life. Plus, I think the creator of the universe, the one who made me, knows what's going to cause me to flourish better than I do. I trust in that. Because we're all following someone, aren't we? Whether it's the stuff we're reading online, people that we're following, friends, we're all following someone. I love how he puts this. Keller says, gospel-believing Christians obey God just to get God. It's not transactional. I'm obeying you because I want to obey you. I trust you. This, I think, this next part, I think, is the crowning jewel in Keller's thought. The idea of the elder brother. 
He does a nice piece of research here in the book that talks about how in Jesus' day, the elder brother, not only his refusal to go in and his anger with the, with the younger brother, but the, the elder brother should have, or the elder son, should have from the beginning said, I'm going to go find my younger brother and bring him home. I'm not going to let this happen under my watch. The elder son was the, the future. He said a true elder brother would have gone out to look for the son. He would have said, Father, my younger brother has been a fool and now his life is in ruins, but I will go look for him and bring him home. And if his inheritance is gone as I expect, I'll bring him back to the family at my expense. And he makes this turn, which I think is a wonderful way of thinking about it, that Jesus is our true elder brother. Go on to the next slide. Jesus is the true elder brother. He invites us to follow in his example. Jesus' whole heart, everything that he's about is what? I'm going to go out and rescue and bring home the lost. Why? Because that's what the Father cares about. It's like, uh, there's, a great, there's a game called Seen It. You ever play that game, Seen It? Play it on TV? Okay, great, none of you. So <laughs> what happens in, uh, in the game is you get different clues about different movies, and one of the things is it's a blurred out picture, and it will slowly come to focus. You have to guess what it is. I feel like this part of, of the gospel, this part of Luke 15, is like a blurred out picture of the entire point of faith, the entire point of scripture, everything all at once coming into focus, that it is all about God's heart to make a way for all of us who are broken by sin to come home. This is everything in one parable. And I'll tell you this, we need to care about, I think this is a takeaway for us Christians, any non-Christians in the room, you're off the hook for this. Christians, We all need to make sure that what we care about is God's heart over everything else. Wouldn't it be worth whatever it takes as far as our time, our resources, all of our ministries, isn't it worth whatever it takes to help everybody in this greater Red Bank Monmouth County area to know that their father is waiting for them to come home. More than that, he's going to meet them where they are to bring them back home. You have been rescued, and this is how you show your gratitude. And we'll close with this. As Keller points out, we serve a prodigal God because that word prodigal means recklessly extravagant. A God who is recklessly extravagant in his love, mercy, and forgiveness for us. Now, this is so important. This is where it has to do with all of us, the church. If our goal is to follow Jesus, not just be a fan of Jesus at the party, but to follow Jesus, where is he going? Do you know where he's going? To seek Jesus and rescue the lost. We need to be a prodigal church called to seek and rescue the lost. This is everything, this is like the beating heart of everything I care about in life. (laughs) This is it. I want people to know that God is real, God is for them, and their life is gonna be better if they have God in it. Both this life and the next. but I can't do it by myself. We need to all be in on the following, you prodigals. Amen.